The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, so hi everyone. We will just wait a few seconds to make sure everything is right. Um, you should be able to see my screen and to hear me okay. Um, anyway, if there's anything wrong during the presentation, you can interact with me through the chat. Uh, just take a few seconds to get familiar with the options I have. Yeah, you can play some questions in case you need to. And the chat box, I will play that on the other screen. Questions as well. All right. Let's just make sure it's recording. Yep, it is recording. Okay, so we will start. So hi everyone and uh, welcome to this presentation, which will be about um, advanced design version 2022 with a focus on steel design. So my name is Thibaut Frete, speaking from France, and I'm a senior product specialist, which means I'm involved in product specification and product validation. All right, so I will be showing you the new features we have for uh, steel design in uh, the latest version of advanced design. And the main one will be the implementation of cold formed design uh, which will give you access to all those sections, uh, like the lipped channels, like the Z sections, or even the Sigma sections. Then I will show you uh, a new finite element object we have, which is called the link at node, and which will um, let you define how members should interact. Um, like um, which degrees of freedom they share and which forces should be carried over from one member to to the next. Then we will jump to the joint design area with um, a new parameter for proper calculation of the rotational stiffness of fixed joints. And the new management we have for uh, design forces on splices. All right, so let's get to it, uh, beginning with uh, cold formed design. I'm just checking that, uh, yeah, I don't, I'm not getting any warning, so I guess you can all uh, hear me okay. All right, so yeah, cold formed design, advanced design. So cold formed design refers to uh, its specific part of the Eurocode 3, which is uh, part 1.3. Uh, but it will also reuse some concepts from um, part 1.5 and part 1.5 we already know that it's uh, already used for class 4 sections this is where you identify the ineffective the ineffective parts of a section you see so all these uh, concepts uh, they still stand for a cold formed uh, design So here you get a, a sample of uh, various cold formed sections. So here we have a lip channel, we have a Z section, but you can also have uh, like usual section, like channels and angles. You can even combine them. You see, you can place two channels front to front or back to back. And what, what makes this uh, cold formed section so special? Uh, that they require a specific part of zero code is that uh, is their thickness actually see they are way thinner than the usual sections if we compare uh, a usual channel with an, an equivalent cold formed channel you see even though they have same height 
like 200 millimeters. Um, thickness is way smaller for cold form section it, from uh, eight and a half millimeters to two millimeters, sometimes even one. But even though they are so thin, they are actually quite resistant because it's all the uh, all the folding, the multiple bands they have, they actually make them stronger and, and stiff enough that they can sustain the forces that are applied to them. Uh, it, it's the same with all materials. You see, if you consider um, a piece of paper, it's very thin. You cannot do much with it, but if you start folding it multiple times, you can uh, even make a paper plane out of it. So it's the same with metal. Uh, when you take uh, a metal sheet and you metal a piece of metal and you fold it for you start bending it with machines uh, multiple times, you actually make the section stronger uh, that it can uh, actually be used for a structural design. Um, but to qualify as a cold formed section, you must meet some geometrical proportions, uh, which um, the lens, which uh, depend on the lens of the part of the section uh, by its thickness. And because these sections are so thin, they will be affected by two effects. The first one we already know, it's local plate buckling. And it refers to uh, part 1.5 of the Eurocode 3. So as I said before, it's a part where you define, uh, you, where you identify the ineffective parts. See the stables, we already know all these tables. Like when you're in pure compression, you will remove the middle of the of a portion of the web or of the flange. Uh, if it's bending, it's uh, affecting the compressed portion of the component. Um, so nothing new there. It's classic uh, uh, classic class four section calculation. And then um, there is a second effect, and this one is new. It's called the distortional buckling, and it's affecting um, the end stiffener of a cold formed section. So the end stiffener is actually the part which is made of uh, half the compressed flange plus uh, the effective part of the leap. You see this, uh, this part here, it's called uh, the leap. Sometimes you have just one fold or you can have a, a double folding, um, but you, yeah, this have the compressed flange plus the leap, uh, that's called the, the end stiffener. And because of distortional buckling, this part, the end stiffener, will be given a reduced thickness. And sometimes you will get a like 60% or uh, even more, uh, reduction of the thickness. So you definitely need to take that into account uh, in the design. And you see, when you start combining these two effects, the section you will uh, consider in the design can be quite different from the section you started with. See, on the left, we got uh, a classic Z section, but because of local plate buckling and uh, distortional buckling, uh, the section you will use in the design is quite different. You see, because uh, of the ineffective parts of the web and of the flanges, um, you have all these portions that you have to ignore. And um, because of this torsional buckling, you have the reduced thickness affecting the end stiffeners on uh, both flanges, because here it's obviously a situation of uh, pure compression. And this part, just getting uh, the effective cross-section uh, is actually the toughest part of uh, cold form design. It's like 50% of the work. And if you do that yourself, you can easily mess up. Uh, it's extremely tedious. So you definitely want a software to, to do that. 
Um, so that was for the theory, uh, and now we can uh, see how it works in advanced design with um, by like checking various proposals you might have for a call form section on a model. See, uh, it's quite common to have um, call form sections used as studs. You see here we have a, a stud which is a doubly pin member in pure compression uh, where they used a lipped channel. So we can definitely introduce that into an advanced design model and see how it works uh, and the results we get. So now let's move on to a, an advanced design model um, with uh, multiple users for call form section. You see here. I have a stud right there, so hopefully you can see my model. If there's anything wrong during the presentation, uh, feel free to interact in the chat. Huh? Let me know if uh, if you cannot see my screen or not hear me well. So yeah, let's uh, place a stud with a cold form section right there, and. See, at the moment, it's a classic eye shape, so we're going to change that. Uh, so first of all, we will define proper material, uh, and for that, we will give it a, a higher um, steel grade, because usually these sections are made of uh, 350 of, or 355 material. So let's choose this one, and then we will define the section. So I will use a user-defined section. See, we have the open rectangular gap entry there. I will define thickness with a one millimeter, just like in the example. Uh, the inner radius will be three, so the outer radius will be plus one. Then, uh, yeah, this field is for uh, the leap. So we'll make it a 15 millimeter leap. Uh, the width will be 45 and the height will be 150 so when everything is set the section looks uh, much better uh, but the important parameter there is uh, the type of lamination you have to set it as cold form yeah, it's hard to read there but it's for a cold form rolled or cold form bent i will tell you what it changes uh, a bit later but make sure it's um, either of these ones to make sure it's properly handled by the cold formed uh, engine in advanced design. But that's pretty much all you need to do because the other parameters we already know. Uh, the releases uh, here, the, the member is uh, properly hinged, see on both ends. Um, you can check the other parameters like, uh, yeah, you can define deflection but we don't expect much of a deflection for a, a pin member in a pure compression so at this point we just uh, we can run the calculation uh, oh by the way a nice improvement in version 2022 uh, is when you're using um, when you're displaying text on the screen like I did on this model to easily identify the key uh, the key members where well, you can increase or, or decrease the font with, with um, the page up page down keys on the keyboard so it's uh, very useful you don't have to go through dialogue like you like in previous versions so it's uh, it's quite useful so I will just run the finite element calculation um, because, you know, when you change the material on a member, you change the cross-section, you need to update um, all the internal forces. And these forces will be used for Eurocode 3 design. All right, so... Yeah, so we have several uh, wind cases. So why the calculation can take a few seconds, but uh, here I'm in control again. Uh, 
And um, yeah, if I switch back, so again, a nice improvement there is you can toggle between display modes uh, without going through the display um, the display style dialog there, and I can get my uh, comment where I was my comment mode where I was uh, using some text on the model. So there I can uh, select member and check the internal forces at the ULS. So I have a significant compression in this member, just like expected. And that's pretty much all I'm getting because I don't have any bending moment, neither in plane nor uh, in the other plane. So we will perform now the Eurocode 3 design on this section. So I can run it on a selected member, uh, something we introduced in the previous version. You see, if I select this dot only and I, uh, oh, sorry, I should have activated this one and run the calculation. See, I'm performing the Eurocode 3 design only on this member. See, calculation is uh, almost instant. Uh, and I can now check the result. So you can display the work ratios graphically, but when you are checking on a specific member, uh, you want to open the shape sheet. And it's the same shape sheet as you are familiar with. Uh, you have a deflection tab, and uh, what is specific now for cold form section is uh, the tab is called cold form design CFD, cold form design resistance. Uh, this shows you that uh, the section was properly handled as a cold formed uh, section. And here we're getting the uh, the expected uh, compression check. See, with the um, design actual force uh, compared to the resistance, giving you a work ratio. Uh, but you can see that this section is not designed by compression. See, the leading, uh, leading, the critical check is actually a mix of compression and bending. See, but how come we have some bending there when we've just checked that there was no bending coming from the finite element calculation? See? Let's just switch to axis rendering. We don't have any bending in either direction. But yet, for the Eurocode 3 design, we ended up with some bending. And that is why what's happening in the design is actually this. So this is a section we start, this is a section we define, the lip channel with a one millimeter thickness. And during the design, what happens is um, you've got the effect of local plate buckling coming in. So yeah, first of all, Advanced Design will automatically ignore the metallic coating on the section. You see, you have a 0 0.04 millimeter uh, zinc um, layer, a very thin layer. It's automatically ignored by Advanced Design. You don't have to do that manually. It doesn't make much of a difference, but it has to be done. And then you have the effects of local plate buckling coming in causing these uh, ineffective parts on the section, a huge part we are losing on the web, and uh, equal parts on both flanges. So this is uh, local plate buckling, part 1.5, classic. And then you've got also, we are losing a small portion at the extremity of the leap. See? And then you've got the effects of uh, distortional buckling with the reduced thickness on the end stiffener. All right. Uh, yeah, let me just check. Activate this. Uh, so you see, you combine these two effects, and this is the section you are uh, ending up with. And thing is, when uh, the section gets altered like this, see, especially with the huge part of the web we are missing out, uh, this is causing a shift of the centroid of the section. See, so the actual force you had 
in the first place, it is no longer centered. See, uh, there is a small offset and this eccentricity is bringing a small amount of weak axis bending. And this is the bending we are getting uh, in the design, which is driving the, the design of the section. And if we look closer at the result, we use a detailed version of the shape sheet. See? So detailed version, very useful because you're getting the reference to uh, each article, but you're also getting the intermediate values. You see, when you have uh, the compressed, uh, the leading, uh, the critical check, this is actually the small amount of uh, weak axis bending you are getting. So the value is very small, but it's applied about the weak axis where the resistance is also very small. So when you add that up, see when you consider the small value it's bringing, you're actually getting plus 22 on the work ratio. And this is why we are jumping from a 65% work ratio in pure compression to the actual 88% uh, for the critical check. And I haven't even touched the, the buckling and lateral torsional buckling effects. So you see, even for um, what seems to be a simple uh, case, like a member in, uh, in pure compression, you can see that the calculation behind is actually pretty complex. Um, but you can also find this cold form section in other places. Uh, it's quite common to have them in, in floors. Uh, you see as a joist, joist. Uh, so right there, it would be a, a member uh, in pure bending this time, uh, still using a lipped channel. And um, yeah, we can definitely introduce that in our advanced design model because I placed such a member here on the on the platform on the floor I have. So you know you can uh, in advanced design you can uh, just focus on a specific part if you've made sure to put that in a separated system. That way I can uh, just check this member here. So it's already defined. So just like before, uh, proper material, uh, cross section as well. So again, it's a classic uh, leap channel. The height is a bit different this time. And what else we have? We can uh, define deflection parameters. Like, uh, yeah, and that's pretty much it. So I didn't change anything, so I don't need to run the finite element uh, calculation again. I can just select this member and run the Eurocode 3 design. Yep. And yeah, we will just check the results in the shape sheet. So this time for member in pure bending, so of course we were expecting uh, the pure bending check, but we are getting a warning about um, deflection. You see here, our deflection limit is exceeded. Um, and if we check the value we have, uh, L over uh, 217, let's see, for a member which is uh, six meter long, see, That's actually um, a 277 centimeter deflection. See? But then if you compare that with the deflection from the finite element analysis, you know, in advanced design, right after the finite element calculation, you can access the deflection uh, on, on a member. See, if we check the in-plane deflection, for the same load case, so an SLS combination with the live load on the floor. You can see there that I'm getting a 
257 centimeters. So you see, it's less than the deflection that is mentioned in the shape sheet after the Eurocode 3 design. See, 257 for, from finite element and 277 from the Eurocode 3 design. And that's because uh, for call form design, uh, the deflection, like uh, the other checks from uh, performed at the SLS, must be done with the effective cross section. Okay, not the not the gross section you had from the start and the one that is used by the fine element analysis, but the one where you remove the ineffective parts and where you give the compressed uh, end stiffener a reduced thickness. So that's why you can get a difference between the deflection from the fine element analysis and the deflection from uh, zero cut three design. So don't be surprised if the deflection you're getting in the shape sheet is bigger than the one you were expecting, because this check uh, must be performed, is performed with the effective cross section. Uh, yeah, but of course, one of the main purposes uh, of these call form sections are as purlins. See, it's uh, often you will find some Z purlins or sigma purlins or even uh, again lip channel purlins. And purlin design uh, with call form sections is actually so specific that it's, um, it has its own part of the Eurocode Suite's uh, dedicated chapter, see, where you will uh, introduce everything you can to help the member, to provide uh, stability to the member. See, you are told how you can introduce the rotational restraints uh, you're getting from the roof, and also the shear stiffness provided by the roof. Uh, formulas for that because uh, what you are using, uh, the way you're modeling this pearl in, it's uh, you have the section with a rotational restraint on the top and a shear uh, a lateral restraint uh, again uh, at the top where the roof uh, is connected to to the pearl in. And to design such a cold formed purlin, you can either use the analytical formulas from uh, this chapter of your code 313, or you can perform a numerical analysis uh, with uh, initial bow imperfection, uh, where you will uh, the imperfection will look like the critical uh, uh, buckling mode performed calculated by. Uh, uh, a model analysis and this is exactly what we are doing in advanced design because this whole process um, you know a numerical analysis with uh, imperfection based on uh, Eigen mode is what we can do if you already know advanced design with the advanced stability feature see so Let's get back to the model and we will define a cold form purling. So either a Z purling or a Sigma purling. We'll, uh, let's start on this side where I have a Sigma purling. Uh, yeah, I will hide the crane because it was, uh, it was showed by my colleague yesterday, the crane. So it's not, uh, it's not on the menu today. So we will, uh, just focus on, uh, this purlin. So right now it's nothing but a classic eye shape, uh, but we, we will turn that into a cold form section just like we did before. So proper material and proper cross section. So let's give it uh, just for a change. Yeah, and the cross section, what I will save real quick the model, we never know. So material cross section, and this time I will not define it myself. I will pick it from the library because uh, in advanced design you have access to uh, a wide array of sections that is shared with advanced steel, and there you can find various cross sections 
including I might have somewhere yes some sigma sections. The uh, they can be coming from a specific manufacturer, but you can also add your own sigma section in there. This is what I did there because I, I wanted a specific sigma section, so I defined it myself. So see here the important parameter uh, for the section to be handled as a cold formed section. And we will use this section for design. So it's uh, displayed as a cold form section there. So I won't, yeah, you can uh, get a, you can see how the, the section is placed along the roof. And this time we will perform um, proper design, taking into account uh, first uh, the deflection. See there, we'll make sure it's, avail it's activated for C design, then we will define the limit deflection. So let's make it, uh, I believe it's uh, 200. And uh, yeah, be careful because here it is a continuous purling. It's a two span purling. It's nine meter long, but each span is 450. So for reference lengths, you don't want to consider the entire nine meters. You want to make sure you are using 450. See, advanced design cannot guess that. You, you have to set that, else uh, the deflection would be failed uh, like every time. So, this is for deflection, and then for uh, uh, introducing the imperfection, taking into account uh, uh, the buckling and everything. This will be done with the advanced stability feature that I was. Uh, mentioning earlier and see when you open the advanced stability dialog uh, in the first tab you're getting the the supports all along the member you see for a, a two span purlin you're getting three supports one two three that you will uh, define as hinged because that's uh, yeah that's what they are right there. Then in the bedding tab, this is where you will uh, introduce uh, uh, the restraint provided by the roof sheeting. You see, so first you will make sure it's applied on the on the top flange because that's where uh, the roof connects to the purling. And you will introduce the rotational, the rotational stiffness or restraint in this field. Just make sure you're set in radians and not in degrees, because um, see, to compute this uh, rotational restraint, you are given a simple formula in zero code 3, uh, where you're, you're actually counting how many connectors you have for one meter of purling. You see, let's say you have one, two, three, four, and five connectors for one meter of purling. You will take this value, like five connectors per meter, and you multiply by one, multiply, sorry. So five multiply 130, and this gives you the rotational restraint in radians or per radians, but not degrees. So you can input this value there. And this is a rotational restraint provided uh, by the roof. This will uh, definitely help uh, stabilizing the member. And then you will define the initial imperfection. And to do that, so bear, bear with me because this is uh, maybe the most complex parameter for uh, the analysis. See, the the imperfection will depend on the buckling curve you're supposed to use. Uh, so first thing is for uh, sigma sections, we are actually not getting any information about the buckling curve. We do have some info for uh, channels or, or Z sections, but nothing about sigma sections, or maybe I, I missed that. But then there is another um, 
article uh, where you told that for uh, Perlin design you're supposed to use buckling curve B and then you would refer to another table from the Eurocode 3 where for uh, buckling curve B and elastic analysis that means for uh, class 3 or 4 sections um, the magnitude of the imperfection the relative magnitude will be 1 over 250 and then you have to remember that for a member in bending uh, you are allowed to consider a 50% reduction on this imperfection so you see to define the imperfection you start from a 250 value but then you can decrease it because of the 0 0.5 reduction for members in bending so that gives you a 1 over 500 and then you have also to check the reference lens because it's just like for deflection the advanced design will tend to consider the entire lens of uh, the two spans so actually the span lens the reference lens is not 9 meters it's 450 so because the lens will be twice bigger i will make sure that my uh, scale factor is twice smaller and that's it and that's how you get the um the, the magnitude of the initial imperfection so let's do that again you see you start from a 250 from the table but you make it 500 uh, because of the 50% reduction and you make it again 1000 uh, because the reference length is not always the one you expect and that's it for that's all you need to do for uh, the imperfection then on the on the loads of set tab this is where you will uh, make sure that the load uh, is actually applied in the on this point because uh, for gravity load or, or an uplift load is usually uh, 0.1 or 0.2 and um, yeah you, you can even go deeper because uh, see if you ever need to define to add some anti-sag bars it's, it's common for for Perlins to have uh, yep, anti-sag bars and so another spring stabs tab is where you can define them you see you can add um, in the middle of each span like uh, 225 you can add a ty restraint which will be a weak axis support because that's exactly what um, what anti-sag bars provide and you can yeah sure at this point you can introduce another one on the second on the second uh, span so that will be 675 so again ty restraints so and let me check everything is in order we've got the roof restraint we've got the imperfection we've got a lot of sets so we're good to go i will just uh, run the finite element calculation right there and then yeah you can ignore this message maybe I just said that before but it's relevant at this point uh, and there we will uh, yeah select the member and run uh, Eurocode 3 design on it So let's give it a few seconds. All right. So this is uh, the Perlin we were uh, working on. So now I can uh, check the steel design there. And we'll check the results. So again, we'll open the shape sheet and see 
how much we got. So deflection is good, but we don't expect much of a deflection issue because we have a two span member. So deflection, uh, we didn't expect it to be an issue there. But you see for cold form design, you're actually getting uh, plenty of checks now. You've got uh, the pure bending, but again, it's not what is driving. It's not a simple matter of pure bending there uh, because you will uh, get other effects adding up. And the leading check is actually this one, total direct stress. You see these three checks, total direct stress, shear stress, one is a stress. These ones are new. Uh, they are actually defined in the Eurocode 3. See? And uh, they affect members uh, which are subjected to torsion. And indeed, uh, it's because of the section we have, uh, the section is asymmetric. So the applied load is not in line with the shear center. So um, you will get some in-plane bending for sure. But then this load, because of its eccentricity to the shear center, it will uh, bring some torsional moment. And this will cause uh, lateral movement of the free flange and this is why for proper design you have to make sure that you're uh, you're getting uh, the actual force if any then the in-plane bending the out-of-plane bending and also the warping effects because when there is torsion there is usually uh, warping and this is exactly what advanced design is doing there and Something else we can notice is that uh, the, the limit stress is actually bigger than what we would expect because we, if you remember, the material we used was a 350 um, steel grade. So how come we've got a 383 limit? Well, that is because for uh, these three checks that I've just mentioned, you are allowed to consider a higher limit. You are allowed to work with the, the increased uh, yield stress, which is FYA. And this one uh, is amplified depending on how many bends you have, or how many 90 degrees bends you have. You see, we have one, two, three, and four bends with a 90 degree angle. And you have one, two, three, four with a 51 degree. So when you throw all that in the formula, you end up with a 383. Uh, limit stress and this is uh, the value you're getting there and if you ever need to uh, help the member you see here we could but let's say you want to decrease that um, well of course you could increase the section but we can also work with the some of the parameters see if I go there and I start changing the rotational stiffness because uh, so far we've used we've used a simplified formula there but there is also an alternate formula which is a bit more complex but when you use this one you can actually get much more uh, better uh, stabilizing effect from the roof and you can easily double this value. So you see, if I use this actual value and I run the steel design again, instead of an H3 work ratio, I will have something much better. Uh, so calculation is done and see this time I'm getting like a 73 work ratio just by changing um, uh, the rotational restraint of the roof. Uh, you can do the same if you start introducing the shear stiffness of the roof you you will get um, you you will prevent the movement of the section even better. So definitely use everything you can to stabilize the member. Uh, all right, so that's it for um, call form design, advanced design. Uh, at this point, I will, uh, we only have like 10 minutes left. So I go a bit faster on the other uh, improvements. And, uh, you know, we have uh, introduced a new finite element object, which is uh, the link at node. 
Um, and this will let you define how intersecting members will interact. You see, you will define which degrees of freedom they share, and that way you will define which forces are carried over from one member to the other. Uh, and if you want to keep it simple, just keep in mind that this is how you would define a hinge between two continuous members. You see, if we take the same two span pearl in there, uh, if you want to make sure it's simply it's hinged on each support, even on the middle one, this is the link at node that you will use. So you will create uh, this object, you will make sure that the rotations are disabled and you will place it. And that way you will get a hinge even on the middle support. And uh, it's something you will define in model phase, so you will not lose it uh, whenever you run the calculation, you know, with all the back and forth from uh, the, the modeling phase and the calculated model. And you don't need to put a node or a point yourself. Advanced Design will manage that during the meshing step. So let's get back to our model. And we will place such a link at node there along the rafter. So, see you pick a uh, link at node. By default, it comes with the rotations disabled. And then you just need to place this object here on the middle support of my Perlin. You can also use that when you have two intersecting bracings. If you want them to be connected by one bolt in their middle, you see the, that way they will touch each other, but they will not transfer any moment. This is exactly what you will be using. And you see when I select such uh, an element, uh, one element, one connected members is set as primary and the other one is secondary. You see primary is element 49 and this will be here the purling and the other one will be element 13 which is the rafter and uh, actually it doesn't matter which one is primary or secondary, you can definitely change that. If you want to swap them, you can. You, won't change anything because what matters is our, um, that they are separated elements. And you see when you pick a different node link, uh, it was properly filled in, like uh, Advanced Design identified uh, the proper purling and so on. So now we will run the calculation. And we will see the difference that it makes on the internal forces. You see, just by, uh, uh, after a finite element sequence, we will see what it changes because we've made, we've introduced this uh, link at nodes on one part of the roof, but we didn't touch the other one. So you definitely cannot miss them. It's uh, displayed as a big node. Give it a few seconds to compute and Right there, we'll yeah, focus on the difference. So you see, if I select this rafter that I didn't touch and I check the internal forces, we've got some uh, bending moment in plane, but we've also got some uh, torsional moments. You see, whenever you get a pearl in connected, you get, this, you get all these spikes in the torsion moments, which uh, don't make much sense. And just because the, uh, the middle support is actually a fixed connection between the two. And if I compare that with the other rafter, you see I'm getting almost nothing and something uniform. Um, see there, it's not exactly zero, but at this point it could it could be zero. So you see the difference between the two elements. So let's say you have a section which is already sensible or, or sensitive to uh, torsional effects. You, you don't want to add to, to add some internal forces that you that are irrelevant. So this is where you would define, uh, you would find some use for the link at node object. All right, so uh, just real quick now, uh, I will show you this, um, this improvement on the rotational stiffness calculation because it, it will definitely help your fixed joints. And again, we will, uh, define them. Let me just uh, select rafter that look pretty much the same with a similar uh, in-plane bending moment, like uh, 
There you go. I will select this one and this one, and I will define some uh, connections. So fixed connection between uh, beam and column. T. So where do they go? They went. Uh, yeah, they went there. Why not? So t to compute the rotational stiffness of the joint, you need to take into account the length of the connected beam. But the length is not just one slope of the roof. Uh, see, it's not. Uh, the 10 meters you have there, it's actually the entire span length with it, which is, uh, in our case, 20 meters. And seeing is, advanced design cannot do that ma automatically. By default, it will consider only one connected member. So you have to make sure that you can now impose the lens to be used for the rotational stiffness calculation. See, so this is a joint we will uh, properly define, and this is another joint that we won't touch. We will see uh, the difference that it makes when switching to connection design. Let's begin with the joint that we didn't touch, the one that is uh, will not return um, proper rotational stiffness. So let's give it a few seconds to to actually load the elements and getting uh, all the internal forces. Um, yeah, I need to update right there. And we will, uh, when I'm in control, I will uh, run the calculation right away and we will check the rotational stiffness we're getting for this joint. So, yep, yeah, it's good now. I will run the calculation and the rotational stiffness will uh, be displayed uh, immediately. You see, it's an important value. So here the joint qualifies as a rigid joint, which is good for you because you don't have to worry about uh, introducing the rotational stiffness in the calculation. But you see, we, we are not that far uh, above the limit. So if I start tweaking the joint, maybe I will uh, fall below the limit and end up with a semi-rigid joint, which is uh, not something you want to do because then you're in for uh, for a headache. Um, because the limit is actually not supposed to be that high. You see, we have a 83,000 uh, limit. But then if I check the joint, which is properly defined, that means with... Uh, proper beam lens, considering the entire span lens. Give it a few seconds. Yep, okay. So you're on the calculation and there you will see the difference. Remember we had an 83,000 limit, but you see the actual limit is 42,000. So there is definitely no risk I definitely have a rigid joint. There is no risk I will fall below this limit and get a semi-rigid joint. So, you know, now that you can define the proper beam lens, I'm pretty sure you won't get any semi-rigid joints on your model, which is something you uh, you, you definitely want. Um, all right, so let's get back to the presentation. Um, Rotational stiffness, we've seen, uh, we can now display the forces on the 3D model. So, yeah, you know, real quick, you can now display the forces there on your model, and you can select the load case. It shows you which uh, bolts are actually put in tension, and it can give you a better understanding of how the connection works. You can see which load cases are placing um, the top bolts in the tension and all. And the last new feature, I'm afraid I won't be able to show that because we only have a few minutes left. But uh, yeah, it's a uh, better management we have for forces and splices because you can now define separately the forces on the left and on the right of the splice. Uh, so I see I have a question there. Can you please repeat, how did you set spring nodal uh, 
Ah, yeah, it was for um, advanced stability. Uh, I'm afraid I will I won't be able to show that again. Um, but don't worry because there will be a recording of this session, so we'll be uh, able to um, access it uh, later. You you will get a link for that. Um, so right, so that's it for um, the new features for Steel Design in version 2022. So uh, remember, we've seen cold form design, we've seen the link and node object, uh, we've seen uh, the proper calculation of rotational stiffness of a fixed joint, and then uh, I just I've just mentioned the better management for design forces on splices. So I hope I kept you interested. Um, if you have any question, uh, I suggest you send me an email. You see, you can contact me at uh, thibaut.frete at uh, greatech.com. Uh, you can ask anything about this presentation or anything about advanced design, and I'll do my best to, to answer you. Uh, and in the meantime, I wish you all a pleasant day, and I hope to see you soon in, uh, in another webinar. So bye, everyone.